Okay, let's get started. Okay. My name is Jennifer Lovell. I'm the library director here at the Franklin Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Great Decisions discussion series on NATO's future with our scholar, John Casca. Um, I'd like to take a few moments and recognize our sponsors, the Franklin Public Library Foundation, with support from the Jerome J. and Dorothy H. Foltz Family Foundation, and Carol and Tom Donovan. I'd like to say a few things about the foundation. I haven't done that yet this year. A lot of people don't know exactly what the foundation is, so when I talk about the foundation, they're like, what the foundation do? The foundation supports a lot of things that you may not know about here in the library. First of all, I'm sure many of you have enjoyed our tree, our children's tree, maybe your kids or grandkids enjoyed the tree and the fireplace. Well, both of those were made possible because of um, financial support from the Franklin Public Library Foundation. They also sponsor a lot of our programs here, including our chair yoga, and our mat yoga. And upcoming, we're gonna have Melinda Myers, um, the garden expert, do a talk on garden trends, and that's all supported by the Franklin Public Library Foundation. So I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them in the important work that they do here at the library. Tonight's speaker is John Katzka. He's a retired senior foreign service officer with 37 years of federal and foreign service experience. He's also a Wisconsin native and graduate of the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So home, home person. A homie. <laughs> Among my, I'm on a variety of different boards up in Cedar Bird. And one of my, I'm the co-chair of the, of the, library fund when we built our library we raised uh, over a hundred thousand dollars more than we needed to put in and so that became our fund and we have given given to the library already sixty three thousand dollars and we're connected through the freedom milwaukee foundation fund so libraries are very special to me I begin my talks with a short introduction to a guide to understanding foreign affairs. Some use hawks and doves. I use realists and idealists. Frag uh, realist, pragmatic. What's our national interest? Idealist, values, democracy, uh, human rights. Neither are Neither are, are right or wrong. Both of them have a role in the process. And it's the question of determining what the balance is. And our, if you look at a short, short history of our country, and it is a short history compared to lots of places in the world, we tend to lean towards idealism. And it flows from a concept called American exceptionalism. We feel strongly in it, and the rest of the world doesn't feel quite as strongly about it. In full disclosure, I lean towards the realist side of the house. And you may see that in my presentation. I should also note that I no longer speak for any US administrations. And where I have not attributed remarks or opinions to someone else, then they are mine. Also feel free to interrupt if there's something that is not clear or if you have a question. For a little history, the NATO Alliance is the first American formal commitment that our government has made to come to the aid of other countries since George Washington, way back when, advised that we should have only have tactical alliances and no long-term commitments to any other country. At its founding, it is interesting to note that there was a disagreement between FDR, president at the time, and his vice president, Harry Truman, along with Britain's Prime Minister Churchill. FDR thought that the UN should be a vehicle for dealing with the world's problems 
But Churchill and Truman saw the beginning of the Cold War and wanted an organization that would deal specifically with the threat of the Soviet Union. Probably as a nod to FDR, the preamble in Article I of the treaty note that the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations serves as a guide for NATO's activities. It's interesting because we wrote both the UN and the NATO. <laughs> it was our language that was put into that. And that comes back now, that'll come back later when we begin to talk about how the world is rearranging itself. Truman, when he succeeded FDR, moved to establish NATO on March 17, 1948, beginning with the 12, the 12 states, principally the ones in the western part of Europe, and the two in North America. Next, Greece and Turkey were admitted jointly, and it's important that they were admitted jointly because it was thought that either one would object to the membership for the other. And it gets into the complications where you begin to get an organization that's getting bigger and bigger. And Europe has so many historical animosities that creep into the discussions of, of where the organization is going. NATO reached its largest existence when West Germany and Spain became members and that was a total of 16 members for, during the Cold War. With the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1992, and I was there for, to witness that in Moscow, there was a debate as to why should NATO continue. Some held that there was no reason. Others called for maintaining the status quo, watching to see what developed in the former Soviet Union. Others still wanted to de redefine and create a new NATO with the option of out of area operations. Decision, the decision was mostly to keep the status quo and begin to develop that out of area NATO mission. There have been three wars in which NATO has participated. And I was there for, for one of those. Uh, the first one is Bosnia slash Serbia slash Kosovo. And that was all a continuation of the same. Uh, and the th next one was uh, Afghanistan, and the third was Libya. And we were a catalyst for most of them, not as much for Libya. I was in Kosovo and Serbia after the bombing stopped as a special envoy to try to pick up the pieces of our relationships with the Kosovars, the Serbs, and later the Macedonians after their civil war. Macedonia is now called Northern Macedonia because Greece would not allow them to come in using just the name Macedonia. Kosovo welcomed us, but in Serbia, I had, where I'd served five years in the late 1980s, the reaction was frosty at best. We have a tendency in picking sides to identify when, when we look at a, a conflict and picking one bad guy because it simplifies things. In the case of Serbia, that was Milosevic. Indeed, he was a bad guy. But so too was Tujman, who was the strong man in Croatia, and to a less degree, He's a Begovic, who was the boss man in Bosnia. And then there was the very questionable leadership of the Kosovo Liberation Army, which spent as much time moving drugs and, and counterfeit goods as they did in fighting. Apparently, that was too hard for Washington to figure out. So Milosevic and Serbia were the only bad guys. Afghanistan was the first and only application of Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. It's probably the most important of all the articles, in which all members of the alliance automatically are involved when any member is attacked. 
The trigger was the bombing of the World Trade Center. As I mentioned earlier, it is one of those one of the considerations when talking about new members, especially those that are in conflict with another country. The removal of Gaddafi in Libya, in my opinion, is best forgotten. It was ill-considered, poorly planned, with no thought of the costs and consequences. And you will hear me talk about costs and consequences often between those idealists and realists, both of them have to pay attention to what are those costs and consequences. Libya remains a very divided state today and is more of a threat to stability in the region than Gaddafi's regime ever was. What does NATO say about itself? Well, I've tightened up the original text. The full explanation will probably fill the next two hours. NATO strives to secure a lasting peace in Europe based on its member countries' common values of individual liberty, democracy, human rights, and rule of law. That becomes a contentious issue today, especially in the developing world and amongst the autocratic states. Europe and North America is inextricably linked to the process. In many ways, this first statement is the crux of the struggle between the democracies and the autocracies. We, the United States, largely set up those values as the norm for international relations after World War II. The autocrats that have always been there are objecting to those definitions as the only acceptable interact, international interaction. The reason that this has become such an important factor is because of China and the fact that it is the second most important economy in the world today. Well, the Soviet Union was a military threat. It had no, it was definitely not a economic threat. Since the outbreak of crises and conflicts beyond allied borders can jeopardize this core objective of ensuring stability for its members, the alliance also contributes to peace and stability through crisis prevention and management and through partnerships with other organizations and countries across the globe. And I'm gonna go back to a slide here. If you look up on the right hand side there, the map at the top on the right notes the number and geographical range of these NATO relationships outside of just the NATO members. There are individual partnership action plans. There are partnerships for peace. There are global partners. And there's even an Istanbul cooperation initiative, just to name a few. Essentially, NATO not only helps to defend the territory of its members, but also engages where possible and when necessary to project its values further afield, prevent and manage crises, stabilize post-conflict situations, and support reconstruction. Again, this is part of that growing divide between the democracies and autocracies. Making collective decisions through consultation and consensus. This is Article 5. As an intergovernmental organization, NATO provides a forum where members can consult on any issue and make decisions on political and military matters affecting their security. All NATO decisions are made by consensus. Everyone has to agree. I want to just say, everyone has to agree. Consensus sounds like there's wiggle room. There are, and this is also one of NATO's limitations. In the recent objections to Sweden's membership to NATO by Turkey and by Hungary show how this is playing out in real terms. Turkey was objecting to Sweden's willingness to allow groups that the, Kurt, that the Turks felt were terrorists to live in Sweden. 
and we've been, we're talking about the Kurds. Hungary's objections are more complex and are an extension of Hungary's president's continuing struggle with the EU. To put it mildly, in terms of how the East Europeans look at this, they're upset with the way Brussels, the capital of the EU, seeks to try to change their lives and interfere in their culture. They feel that they got, they thought they had got past that kind of interference when they left the Warsaw Pact when they were part of the broader Soviet empire. Well, now Turkey's parliament has just cleared Sweden's membership and Hungary's parliament just did the same within the last couple of days. So membership for Sweden is, is imminent. I was surprised by that because Sweden did so well being neutral and they made lots of money working off of both sides for a long time. And uh, so it was a surprise that they decided that they wanted to move on this. Okay, setting NATO's strategic direction. NATO's fundamental security tasks are laid down in the 14 articles of the treaty. And I've already mentioned number one, number, number one, the key one is, is uh, no, article five. Adapting to new security challenges in the world as the world changes. During the Cold War, NATO focused on collective defense and the protection of its members from potential threats from the Soviet Union. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of non-state actors affecting international security, many new security threats had emerged, such as terrorism, and hence NATO being called into action when the World Trade Center was bombed. Moreover, Russia's Sorry? Oh. Uh, moreover, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, including its annexation of Crimea in 2014, and its full-scale invasion in February of 2022, is, in NATO's view, radically, uh, radically altered the security environment in Europe. Increasing of, increasingly of concern is the potential, additionally, uh, increasing concern about the Arctic which had previously been frozen, which is becoming navigable and becoming an issue of concern to Europeans as well as, as, as a new opportunity to move things not through the Mediterranean. So we get to post-Cold War expansion. And those of you who were here last year, uh, will remember some of the things I said, and I've, I've, I've adjusted them a little. There is disagreement within American foreign policy circles whether we should have expanded NATO further east and more serious disagreement to the later efforts to include Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. I was in Kiev, as it was called then. It's now called Kiev. when George Herbert Walker Bush came down from that, from a visit in Moscow, and I came down on his, not on his plane, but the second plane, uh, and told the Ukrainians back in 1992, largely to stay put within Russia. <coughs> we were concerned about nuclear weapons that were st stationed in Ukraine, but we were also thinking about the general stability in the region. Well, it didn't take us long to change our minds. We then decided that recognizing the independence of the 15 republics of the Soviet Union was a useful way to weaken Russia and promote democracy within those other 14 republics. Clearly, we were more successful in the recognizing than we were in the democratizing. <coughs> Let me note that none of the 15 republics, including Russia, had any power during the Soviet Union, as nor did they have it during Tsarist Russia. They were simply administrative regions, as they had been during the Tsarist Russia before. 
What the previous map does not show is an important slice of Poland that Stalin took after World War II and made it part of the Ukrainian Belarus republics. You see Lviv there, or Lvov as it was called before. Uh, that became part of the Soviet Union and now, and that piece there is all part of, of the Ukraine area. Lest you feel that the Poles were cheated on this, uh, the Poles received a slice of Germany as compensation. So it's, it's unlikely that the Poles are going to uh, uh, go seeking to get their lands back from the Ukrainians because then they would have to give those lands back to the Germans. And in that part of the world, respect flows west and contempt flows east. back to the map. Russia at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union had a different map in mind than that of the West, though it took them nearly a decade to define it. I suspect some of you are aware that the former Fox commentator Tucker Carlson had a long interview recently with Vladimir Putin. Well, it was more of a monologue and I stayed with it through two hours of the translated text. I didn't even try it in Russian. Putin spent much of his time laying out a very detailed and somewhat controversial from the Western viewpoint, a geographical history of Russia. I'll give you a much more condensed version, minus most of the controversy. Of course, you wouldn't want to have the controversy, would you? <laughs> If you look at the map, Ukraine became part of Russia in 1654. I threw that, uh, that thought out earlier. They had been part of Poland before that, and they were, the Poles were trying to convert them, these Cossacks, as they were, that were occupied the area of, of what was Ukraine then. And they were mostly Russians that had come across the border because it was, it was like Texas in the, in the 17, in 1800s, 1800s. Uh, Wild West, and the very, the very word Ukraine means borderlands in Russian. So it was the borderland area. What is now southern and eastern Ukraine was taken from the Ottoman Turks in the 1750s by the Russians. That's the end of our history lesson on the origins of the Russian Empire. That wasn't so bad, was it? During the 1990s, a big leap forward, while the Russians were, were going through a form of PTSD, and I can tell you they were having PTSD, people who had had responsible positions were going into <clears throat> dumpsters looking for whatever they could find. It was terrible. I was there from until late 1992, and I was, my, my tour ran, ended. Yeltsin, then president, who had been considered a gadfly by the top Soviet leadership during the last years of the Soviet Union, inherited the leadership role because he was the sitting head of the Russian Republic, as did all the others. They had presidents, and part of that was the when they set up the UN, I forget if the Soviet Union got three or four votes because they were such a big country, they, they, they gave, Ukraine had a vote in the UN, and uh, two other places had votes in the UN. So they, actually, they didn't have any votes because they were told what, the, what was, what was going to happen. Yeltsin really didn't have a plan. He kind of bounced from <coughs> one US idea to another. Uh, some. It's hard to believe that in the Soviet Union and Russia, someone would have a drinking problem. But I swear it, I swear it's, it's, it's the climate. When you go through a winter where you don't see daylight, what else are you gonna do but drink? Under something called the Freedom Support Act, and my ambassador at the time, Bob Strauss, who was very influential in the Democratic Party, 
was asked by Herbert Walker Bush to be the ambassador and to help him push this Freedom Support Act through, the, through a democratically controlled Congress. Well, we poured lots of money into democracy promotion and mark, free market projects. Uh, the results of that, we may have convinced some people, and they probably are working on Wall Street now, or were, they probably retired now. <coughs> We assisted the establishment of lots of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, for the kinds of active these social activities that are very much part of our culture. It was a vehicle for social activism that we know well. During that PTSD period, there was very little resistance to any of this stuff. They were still reeling from the impact of all of this coming apart. That level of cooperation and many of those NGOs disappeared in the early 2000s. So the reaction from Moscow began to become more strident when Putin became president in 1999. When, and in 2004, this is key, the price of oil skyrocketed and Putin was able to put together a significant sovereign wealth fund of over $600 billion uh, and began to react as NATO pushed up closer to the border of Russia. Frankly, we wouldn't be talking about NATO as part of great decisions in the, if the war in Ukraine wasn't ongoing. We have blessed Ukraine as a democracy because it is in our interest to do so. Though we assisted the ouster of a duly elected Ukrainian president in the process, though one we didn't like. Ukraine has become our poster country for the growing struggle between the democracies and autocracies. Except for the slice of Poland that I mentioned earlier, the rest of Ukraine has been Russian for centuries. Basically, Ukrainian culture is Russian culture. Before the invasion, some to many thought of NATO as largely a gentleman's club and of decreasing value. The incursion clearly was a shot in the arm for the alliance. Within days of the invasion, several things began to happen. Supply lines were set up to move and appropriate, to, uh, appropriate war materials to Ukraine. Plans were made to equip and train the Ukrainian forces and ground and air naval forces were sent to the Baltics to remind Russia of NATO's responsibility to protect its members. You may recall that the level of support to Ukraine and the activity of NATO members was carefully orchestrated to avoid a significant Russian reaction. There was a very careful move of everything that we moved was appropriate for the time and for what Russia was doing as well. Only, okay, why did Russia invade? And this is the position of Jeffrey Morton, who did the master class on NATO's future as part of the great decision offerings. And Jennifer tells me that that video will be available to you as soon as they stop using them for the great decisions programs. To set the stage, Russia and most Western military experts expected that with 180,000 Russian troops poised above Kyiv, that Zelensky and his cabinet would head to Poland and Russia would install a new leader or reinstall Yanukovych, who had been rather unceremoniously fled. And uh, that would be that. Well, obviously, that isn't how this story turned out. Zelensky has been resolute, skillful, especially in his dealings with NATO countries. Morton and I, and I agree with him, says that Ukraine and Belarus were considered by Moscow to be critical factors in maintaining its strategic depth. And the idea of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO was unacceptable to Moscow. We knew that all the way through this process. 
As Morton pointed out, Putin may have misread the level of, of dysfunction that was occurring in the United States. They certainly, well, it's, it's going on right now. But we were, able, we, we were able to put together a response to the invasion. I thought you would want to see what is, where things are right now. The, the summer offensive never happened from the Ukraine. Uh, Russia had, had embedded itself significant to the point that they were taking on such huge casualties to try and take anything that they gave up. Then there was the, the issue of is there continuing uh, supplies coming their way? The key points from Russia's point of view, and I think it's useful to know what the other side is thinking. We, we, all, we, we hear what our side is thinking. Are the remaining pieces of the Donbass, you see Bakhmut and Avdivka, which just fell, that there's a, a little bit darker line of, that runs along outside there. That's the Donbass. That was, that Russians considered that their territory <coughs> on, the, on the east. And the rest of the southern area, including Odessa, probably, possibly to the border with Moldova, which would give Russia then access to its holding in the Transnistr. Yeah, he wants to get caught up. There's Moldova, there's the Transnistria right there. And that is occupied by Russian troops and has been occupied by Russian troops since the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were there before, during the Soviet Union, but stayed. Let's shift gears. And let me give you a quick survey of what is happening in Europe because the issues that the various countries face today. Ah, I got one more point, but going back to the last slide. George Friedman, who is the, runs a, a, an outfit called Geopolitical Futures, and I'm a subscriber. It's a, it's a subscriber based intelligence unit, came up with. <coughs> captured, in my mind, the period leading up to the invasion, and I'll quote, American intentions were not to launch an eventual, the eventual invasion of Russia, though it did have a small interest in limiting Russian influence. But in statecraft, where intention is simply the quacking of ducks, heard that before, intentions can change in minutes, what Russia paid more heed to was capabilities. Whatever their intentions, the US and NATO were in no position to invade Russia. Yet Russia feared that their intentions could change, as could their capabilities. A war should begin when the enemy has no intention to fight and has limited capability. So this Russia was seizing a opportunity where we were not prepared to deal with it. I'll let you think about that for about three seconds. <laughs> Let's shift gears. And I mentioned this already. Europe has got several issues that affects their interest and ability to support NATO. Farmers illustrate Europe's unhappiness with the economy in a whole range of countries, Bulgaria, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Poland, and Romania. Their unhappiness is with climate change policies coming out of the EU, bureaucrats making regulations without understanding how it affects people on the ground, the cost of energy and inflation. 
of a transit workers uh, in a number of countries are also on strike. Now in France, in the summertime, strikes are given because this, is, this adds to their month-long vacation time. <laughs> there exists through social media the ability of these disgruntled workers to broaden their appeal and further disrupt the economy and politics in the EU. It also offers Russia and anti-democratic states an opportunity to meddle. We are more open to meddling than they are from us. A closed society controls all those, all those instruments. We don't. It's one of, would we want it any other way? No, probably not. But that's one of, the, one of our weaknesses. <clears throat> While there have been many elections among the NATO member states this year, a key election is for the European Parliament in June. The, the, the Parliament itself has no power, really. It, it's a sounding board like the General Assembly is, uh, with no, no powers that it can, other than the, the voice in the pulpit. But they do determine the composition of the EU Commission that does have power. So that's going to be in June of this year. 2023 was tough on the EU countries' inflation rates. And you look at Hungary up there, sticking right up in the middle there, uh, which was about 20% inflation. And then, but there were a number of others at 10% inflation rates. In 2024, EU businesses are trying to balance support for Ukraine, climate change policies, the higher cost for energy, and the cost of all the refugees and migrants that are flooding the EU. Not an inconsequential in that last one. Germany is said to have been in recession for half of 2023. And if the EU reimposes tight public spending, that will affect growth potential for the bloc as a whole. All of this is background to most of the members are part of Europe and part of the EU. And so therefore, their willingness and ability to be able to support NATO, it rests on their ability to be able to pay and not be distracted by other issues. France began 2024 with an overhaul of Macron's government. The movement on reforming the generous retirement system is not on the books right now. Additionally, both Germany and France face strong opposition from the right, the AFD in Germany and the Le Pen in France. And rounding up the issues, are what to do with the refugees and migrants, mostly from the Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. Germany has absorbed over a million Muslims. Southern Europe has been the hardest hit and wants redistribution, but that is being challenged, especially in Eastern Europe countries. And the rise of the far-right parties is closely tied to this issue. The Ukrainian war has been an important crisis for NATO. <coughs> NATO has not only united around this crisis, but has added key countries, Finland and Sweden, to its number. With all the backslapping, there are weaknesses that go into question its continuing relevancy. And I'll list a few of those things. Is Russia a credible enough opponent going forward to justify the costs involved? question we'll ask after this war is over and how badly the Russia has beaten up in the process. The European members of NATO are independent states for all the noise they make about making the EU a political organization. And, key, all the members have to agree to standardize their military establishments. And just this morning, something crossed my desk, that, that France is called for establishing a, a defense 
supply mechanism so that France, Europe will be able to supply its own armaments and not have to turn to the United States for, for this. That affects a big piece of our, uh, of our uh, exports. Not the ones that we like to brag about, but it, it is, it's a reality. So as we look to the future of NATO from our perspective, we are the glue that keeps the alliance going and funded. NATO, as I mentioned earlier, is also a way that we, the United States, can affect European policies. France is the most outspoken against that, our ability to do so. And it goes all, all the way back to De Gaulle. The number of those states that are members of NATO keeps getting larger and more diverse and bring with them historical animosities. Getting European members to pay their fair share has become a US domestic political issue. Though NATO was involved in Afghanistan and Libya, it has been a European-based structure. There are hints of a broader set of definitions. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has argued that NATO's new strategic con uh, concept must address the challenge of Russia and China as the, <clears throat> as the two plus others challenge the existing rules-based border. What we're talking about here are all the institutions and understandings that we put into effect after World War II. There was no one there to <clears throat> say you can't do this. Our allies were in a terribly weakened and, 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 and hurt state. The developing world was not there yet. The developing world really ignited in the, in the 1960s into the early 1970s. So there was no one but us to make these decisions and we didn't let the, the Soviets sit down with us and say, okay, let, we'll trade you this one for that one. Stoltenberg is also talking about the rise of the world into democracies and autocracies, with some nations playing both camps, depending on the issue. Getting smaller European countries to want to use NATO as a tool to confront China may be difficult. They may be more willing to accept the concept of us versus them, with the US being the West plus Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. But that's a whole new structure in itself. NATO absorbing all of those countries will add new complexities. With the opposition to this grouping being China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. But there are others that will creep into that. Countries like Turkey and India, to name two, are prepared to play with us on some issues and side with the autocrats on others. India works closely with us in something called the Quad. Australia, New Zealand, United States, no, Japan is not New Zealand. Uh, India, Japan, Australia, and the United States on China issues. India has a very strong concern about Chinese encroachment on their territory and on economics and, and influence in, the, in their part of the, of the world. On the other hand, Tur uh, India has, has, has been a welcoming, welcome Russian oil and gas and uh, business opportunities. Turkey is doing some of the same on the other side of the map. We are aware of our political circumstances. We know here at home. We know that the outcome of our presidential election could have a profound effect on NATO and its mission, and especially on the war in Ukraine. There has been a recent exchange between the former between former President Trump and the Secretary General of NATO over the level of contributions to the alliance. 
with Mr. Trump again challenging members to pay their fair share and the Secretary General stating that now 18 of 31 members are set sometime this year to reach the 2% goal. Though an improvement, that is just over 50% of their members who are paying their fair share. And I think Trump has a good point there. In the short term, because this is NATO's future, this is talk, I mean, we spent a lot of time in the past, now we're getting to the future. In the short term, next three to five years, NATO's future is tied to the outcome of the war in Ukraine. At the July 2023 NATO summit in Vilnius, Latvia spoke of a shift in mood in NATO. While there was celebration as Finland joined their number, the gathering also exposed deep disagreements, especially on whether to admit Ukraine to NATO. Poland and the Baltic states were for doing so, but an unannounced number of members did not agree, and the summit communique was an ambiguous, ambiguously worded statement, and I've participated in many ambiguous statements that NATO would invite Ukraine to join, and I quote now, when allies agree and conditions are met, end of quote. Oh, where do we go here? Eugene Rumer shared with Carnegie Foundation leaders recently his take on the situation I'm going to give you a couple of those other takes. On the ground, the state of the war at the two-year mark is effectively the same as it was at the one-year mark. Both sides suffered massive losses in 2023. Military experts now judge that neither side has what it takes to radically change the situation on the battlefield. With both sides resolved to achieve their vision of victory, just as they were a year ago. Nothing suggests that the war will end soon. Other writers and commentators noted that Ukraine's earlier technological advantages is gone. And now it is Russia with a savvier tech position. So let's look at four possible outcomes. Again, NATO's short-term future is tied to what happens in Ukraine. If Russia were to prevail, more so than currently defined, NATO would have reason to be concerned about further territorial ambitions on the part of Russia. If in the process it replaced the leadership in Ukraine, that would increase the concern among NATO nations, thereby increasing interest in NATO and its defense and its funding. If Ukraine would improve its position and force Russia into negotiations, that would be a major humiliation for Putin and could lead to regime change regardless of the outcome of the March Russian presidential election. He's running largely unopposed. And the question becomes in, in, the, in, in, the, in Russian elections now, is what, how does the elite there see the results of the election and they'll watch to see what percentage it gets. So it's not a question of just winning, it's got to, it's got to win by a, a, a certain percentage to assure all of the people who are supporting you that uh, you're going to be able to continue to do what you're doing. In the short term, that Ukrainian improvement would probably lessen NATO concerns and reduce the move to expanding military capabilities. The threat of the use of Russian tactical nuclear weapons cannot be ignored or dismissed under this option and would be more of a possibility depending upon the extent of Russian territorial losses. If nothing really changes and the battleground continues to be largely what we see today, that I will think will result in contrary forces. Some moving for greater military preparedness, 
others poo-pooing the need. The result of this outcome would be terrible for Ukraine because Russia did not contribute to its reconstruction, and Europe and the US, depending upon who is the president of the United States, unwilling to shoulder the expense. The possibility of regime change in Kiev rises as a result. Another possibility, lots of possibilities here, uh, is nothing significant change happens, and Russia keeps the territory it occupies and forces Ukraine to become neutral, blocking any integration into the EU or NATO. This outcome will be a terrible blow to NATO, especially depending upon who was in the White House at the time. The alliance has had an interesting career. During its existence, <clears throat> suspicion among some European allies, and I mentioned them earlier, principally de Gaulle in France, have been concerned about the degree that Washington exercises influence in European affairs. That earlier suspicion still exists and has made more difficult with the expansion of the alliance into Eastern Europe, because Eastern Europe is much more closely connected to the United States than it is to Western Europe. Uh, not geographically. Former President Trump, I would I'd say awkward recent remarks. He was correct in saying the Europeans need to pay their fair share, and then he, he did not have to say that he was telling them that he would tell Moscow to go and attack them if, if they didn't pay their fair share. That just wasn't necessary. NATO's future, I think, is tied to the question of the rising clash of democratic nations versus the autocrats. NATO probably would have to be willing to add Australia, Japan, possibly South Korea, and New Zealand to its numbers if it were to be credible, a credible deterrent to the largest of the autocratic states, China. Doing so might make it more credible, but would introduce a number of new challenges, like North Korea, to the alliance's strategic definitions. And we have kicked that North, North Korean question down the, that can down the street for now probably four, four decades. And we haven't come up with a way in which to deal with it. The world we face is messier than that of the Cold War. This messier world has been evolving for some time. I've been calling it a clash between the democracies and autocracies, but it is messier, a fuzzier, fuzzier than that as well. I mean, the, the, the role that countries like India and Turkey are playing, and Brazil, uh, and the, the, those in the BRICS, are you familiar with the term, the BRICS? That's Brazil, India, Russia, China. South Africa. Uh, South Africa. South Africa. South Africa. But now they have added four more or five more countries to their number. This is kind of going back to the 1970s when the non-alignment movement was going. And uh, uh, Nehru and Tito and, uh, and the president of Egypt and one other were organizers of the non-alignment movement. In that context of that messiness, NATO or its individual members will occasionally be more of a convenience than a tie that binds, simply because it's not, when it gets fuzzy, things get fuzzy, it's harder to see where your interests lie when you have a clear black and white situation. It's much easier to come to a conclusion. Thank you to all of you. Thanks to the Franklin Library, its board, and friends for underwriting the cost of these programs and for their continuing support for foreign affairs programs. And if you look at that cartoon, please do not take the chance. <laughs> Thank you. Now, yes. I'm going to pull the chair up.
as an octogenarian, I have certain rights. <laughs> Hi. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Katzbeck? Uh, you was he's right behind you. Um, World War One started as a group of uh, small countries that were very much larger than they band together. Which what's what's that? World War One started as a band of alliances. The small countries are worried about large countries, so they band together to defend themselves against larger countries, attack the possible attack by the large countries. Would this be considered a repeat of World War One scenario? The small countries uniting to protect themselves from larger countries. Yes. Well, they the alliances with each other to set a team. To a degree, that's what NATO was. It was. We saw the we saw the issue. The, and through the war, in terms of how the Soviet Union and Stalin behaved, the Europeans, some of them who were fighting with communist elements within their own societies, uh, was a, it, Greece was one of those where it was a toss-up as to who was going to win, but, but France and, and not Germany anymore because the Nazis took care of it and left us there. Yes. Oh, well, you're thinking. You, that's the you're talking almost like the, about the United Nations General Assembly, which has has is a wonderful place to sound off, but has no effective enforcement. Uh, and the the main the main powers are are never going to give. A grouping of small countries, unless it was every small country, and there's, I, I can't see that that would happen. I don't see that the conditions right now would bring about a, a situation where all of the small countries would come together. There are too many vested interests and too many cross interests that <clears throat> that wouldn't allow that. So I don't think that's that that's feasible. But, but I can see, well, ASEAN is a good case of point of small countries uniting, but it is terribly ineffective because it has too many different orientations. Some of the more northern ones are much closer to China and are landlocked and have less interest in connecting up with the Philippines and Indonesia. So it's too broad an area with too many different interests in, and the, the wrong kind of geography for for this to come together. Yes. Is there any alternative leadership in Russia that potentially would be you know, have a more conciliatory attitude? Um, you know, when the invasion of Ukraine started, there were a lot of newspaper articles predicting that Putin was going to die. It was cancer. And now we see articles, he has a, a body double, and it's not even there. Um, you know, you've heard the expression, the devil you do know is preferable to the devil you don't know. Um, is there any devil there in Russia who is preferable from our standpoint, no. from the standpoint of our interests, okay? So no. you feel it would only be worse. Uh, there, uh, there is opposition that he isn't moving fast enough and hard enough. Uh, Russian culture, we don't understand it because it is diametrically opposite of ours. We, the individual is the most important component of our culture. In fact, we're the most individualistic country in the world. Maybe there's someone else out there, but I don't know. Russia, the individual is unimportant. It's the group, it's the nation. When I get into a discussion of how good we had it back here, the Russians, at a certain point, they would say, Unas Nuche, we have it better. It was a standard, standard expression. Very chauvinistic, very xenophobic. They were occupied by the Mongols while Europe was going through the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. They missed out on that. When Peter the Great invited all of those Westerners to come in, 
it wasn't to, there weren't professors coming in to talk to them about democracy promotion. They were engineers who were giving them ways in which to produce what they were doing better or what they weren't producing. So it's, we, we just really, totally opposite. Under Tsarist, Soviet, and Putin, national security trumps economics every time. Our society, economics leads. So how we get together on these things, we have to assume that we're never going to come to agreement on what we should be, what they should be. Well, we know what they should be. Uh, and we spend a lot of money trying to change them. There's lots of other places in the world too, and with no success. And what, what we end up doing too often is that people who like our ideas, who recognize they want to be individual, they come west. This has happened under the czars, it happened in the communist era, and it's happening now. So they, they get rid of the people who are potentially opposition. Navalny was, Navalny, it's very interesting, uh, for the State of the Union address, that's, when was that, tonight? It was tomorrow. 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 Uh, the, the president's wife had invited the, the, uh, the, the, the wife of uh, Navalny to the affair, and she declined. Uh, because, I don't know, how did that go? Because Navalny was a nationalist. Like Solzhenitsyn before him. They were Russian nationalists, even though they came out. Uh, lots of these, I, I, I can't tell you the number of programs I've listened to of exile, Russian exiles here, uh, intellectual exiles. Uh, I, I think the others would be more, the non-intellectual would be more interesting. But they're, they're, they're fighting for where they, who they can become now here in this society. And they, our, our, our think tanks and our academic institutions are gobbling them up. Yes. You mentioned about three Mississippian presidents who you thought were so disconnected. Was, was that the, the, the three Mississippian presidents that you said you, you didn't like them? I, I still would. The previous Ukrainian president, you said we didn't like him. Was oh, Yanukovych, yes. Yes. Why? Uh, because he wasn't a Democrat. And we thought that Ukraine was moving in the direction. They have had successive demonstrations in the center of Kiev with, that led to new elections that brought in the same kinds of people, except for Zelensky this time. This is different. And most of, and, and a part of that stimulus for those demonstrations came from that piece of Poland that was part of the, 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 that became part of the Soviet, of the Soviet Union and now Ukraine. So I don't say that's the only reason, but they are they were more forceful. We were not allowed to travel in that part of Ukraine during my two tours in Moscow because because there was such un, unrest there. Yes. Uh, USA is the founding father of NATO, even though we are in North America. And uh, we all know why NATO has been created, so that we have a buffer zone for Russia. Otherwise, and the NATO members already know that the main reason for the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization is created for the benefit or different sales or armaments to the world. And and at the same time, so they are not, I'm pretty sure, they are not that much interested to increase their spending or share as uh, Trump wanted that. Second thing is we encourage only European treaty, but we don't encourage or please with the uh, other Asians or Asian countries or African countries to form alliance or treaties like that. And Russia, we have been supporting Ukraine for so long 
and spending so much money of our dollars and we ourselves have problems for our healthcare, Medicare, social security, student loans, mortgages and uh, people are aware of all these uh, aids that we are giving away to different foreign countries just for their own benefit but uh, the whole uh, majority of the population is definitely against all this. Yeah, I, I, polls are very hard to read. Uh, as, as pollsters have no control over their audiences, <laughs> but they do have control over their questions. And so you have to look at what the poll, who is sponsoring the poll as to if the Republicans are sponsoring the poll, the questions they're gonna ask will lead in a slightly, in, in, in a particular direction. And Democrats, the same. You made a couple points there. And the, we've got to go back to the point when NATO was established and the conditions in Europe in the late 40s. I was in grade school already. Isn't that frightening? <laughs> And it was not happy. I mean, I mentioned Greece, which was very close to going communist. Uh, the leaderships were in disarray. Uh, Eastern Europe had been swallowed up by the Soviet Union into something called the Warsaw Pact. Then France, France had, had severe labor issues. Churchill was bounced out of the leadership right after the war by a more socialist or a labor leader. So there was, Europe was not in a position to be able to try and chart where it wanted to go. We stepped into that. We had, we wanted to make sure that where they were going was in our interest. Not necessarily our ideology, but we knew that they weren't that far off of our ideological definitions. So it was a it was comfortable territory to go into. When we get into this, this question of the Cold War as it developed, at the beginning of the Cold War, we were very, I, I, my best recollection is that we were rather strict in terms of defining who was with us and who wasn't. But as the Cold War went on, we, I was in Zambia from 81 to 84, uh, involved my, very much in the Southern African countries becoming independent and free from South African control. But right next door was Zaire and Mobutu, one of the most corrupt persons you could ever imagine. And he was, he was in our camp, and we, we played to that because he was the strongest leader in that part of Africa. There were enormous natural resources that were in his area, and if he fell, we saw chaos in there and the opportunity for the communists to come in, the Soviet Union to come in. They were all over the place. Where every time I'd moved around, I'd run into a Soviet embassy or a Soviet officer who happened to know that I spoke Russian. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so as now, at the end of the Cold War, all of a sudden there wasn't this ideological litmus test. All someone had to say is, we don't like communists. And lots of authoritarians do not like communism. They like to control the, the economic instruments. So now we took that away, and now it's democracies versus autocracies. Well, it becomes more complicated. And we're gonna, and that's where that fuzziness comes into this process. Our relationship with India, is, is, is we are being very, because of India's size, because of its technological importance, because, because of its position and its position in the area as an alternative to China, it becomes more important to us 
than the alternative of saying, India, you're backsliding on your democracy. We're very careful in what we say about Modi, the president of India, and we should, because it's not in our interest to go and beat him up over what's happening in his country. Whenever something begins to come apart, and this is, this is definitely what's happening, those who say we're, we're still the essential country in the world, not as much as we were. Not as much as we were. It has to do with our economic capabilities, not our military so much. We're still the largest military in the world. We're still the largest economy in the world. But our ability to influence and look inside ourselves, inside ourselves we are divided into, into how we want to divide ourselves. And I'm not taking sides in this process. In fact, one of the things I do is I try to analyze what are the points of various sides. So, so I sit down with a, a Trumper and I'll say, well, what about this and this? And then I'll sit down with someone on the left and I'll say, well, what about this point that he makes? And there are good points. There are valid points on both sides. It's just that there's no common connection between the two sides right now. Where do you see the Ukraine war really ending up? Do you really think the Ukrainians have a chance, or no. is Putin just going to eventually You use have to look at geography, size, and also that culture. Everyone, you see the headlines coming in. And, and I, the West, Western media has not covered itself with glory about its objectivity about reporting on what's going on. Uh, we accept Ukrainian press releases, releases as gospel. Winston Churchill said at the beginning of World War II, the first casualty in war is the truth. And he was talking about his own side too. So that's propaganda. One thing I think about the war, and I ask this question, how do you fight a war in your backyard and win? Which is what Ukraine's doing. They're basically just holding their own country. Library patrons attend is kind of hard to win when you're you fighting your backyard. Yeah, exactly. and, and they, the Russians don't, the, from their culture, have never cared about losing troops. It's not a big deal. The, the mothers will cry at home. But the, the culture, Afghanistan was a little bit different. There was some uh, concerns. But this was also a factor of the Soviet Union running its course. They were kind of run out of steam, and so that people were beginning to talk, speak out. I think the backyard analogy is interesting because Ukraine didn't have that. It's not like they had that choice. Like, I don't, want to, fight, I don't want to fight a war in my backyard, but if somebody brings a gun to my backyard, I'm going to war. Yeah, well, they're only <laughs> fighting in their own backyard. They're not taking it into Russia. And how do you stop? Aggression in your country if you're just only letting aggression come your way. You don't. You, you just. You just can't fight a war in your own country and defend only your own self, and let the other guy just live his country without any uh, impact militarily. Right. There's a there's a military impact. Yes. I agree with that. Um, just the numbers and the location. We. My guess, this is not, I'm not projecting this, I, my guess is that Europe and we will, at a point, will say we've got to find a, a solution to this because we can't, we can't stay with it. If you look at the amount of money we have been throwing into debt for a whole number of things, the COVID, for, for the infrastructure, our debt is becoming Unseemly. Now, relatively, we are still we still are doing pretty well, but this that debt keeps growing, and both parties there's no fiscal conservatives left in Washington. Both parties are anxious to spend money, but on their things as opposed to the other side's things. But is that not the the real question about this whole NATO thing? What, the return on investment, the amount of money we dump on NATO. Do we actually see what we've spent? Well, we can, we can in terms of it having been successful during the Cold War. But that ended. Well, and that's, 
Yeah. There, and so right. you can you can get ten speakers to come in and talk to you about this, and you're going to get ten different takes because it's hard to get two two people to agree on the same things because each of them looks at puts more importance on this one as opposed to that quality that in, that, that ingredient. If you're an idealist, you're 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 in there, right? And if you're a realist, you're saying, well, what are the costs and consequences for this? How long is this going to go on? And how much money do we dump in? Yeah. Okay. I think it's time to wrap it up. But if you'd like to stay behind and talk with with John, you're welcome to do so until for, for a few more minutes. For a few more minutes. <laughs> Thank you for Thank coming. You. I have a friend who's, uh, is, who's a, a journalist, a, a science writer, and we occasionally have gotten into discussions about foreign affairs. And he's a black and white person. And I'm saying, foreign affairs is all about the grays. Rarely do you have a clear cut idea of what you should be doing or why. You have to weigh the various factors, and it's all grays. So, thank you. Thank you.